Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on Justice Talks. And this is our first guest um, in a while um, because we haven't been on air. So I'm excited because it's a woman that is talking about a subject that a lot of us don't um, necessarily talk about. And so thank you again for joining us. Um, take this time to share this video with your friends. If you, when you hear what we're going to be talking about and you are um, interested in it, make sure that you tag someone and say you have to listen. So uh, today I have with me Dr. Susan Howell, and she wrote a book called Buried Talents, Overcoming Gendered Socialization to Answer God's Call. And uh, when I first uh, heard about the book, I, of course, had to dig in a little bit more because I'm like, okay, what is this saying? Because all of us have experienced people talking about buried talents. We also know the buried talent story in the Bible. And I wanted to see what where she was getting at. And let me tell you something. Um, I really felt like this book is something that needs to be discussed in, um, in churches, uh, everywhere uh, that there's some discipleship going on in our schools, because uh, especially early, young youth ministry especially, because uh, we, don't, we don't find out about some of this stuff until we're like in our 30s. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Susan Howell. And tell us a little bit about yourself, Susan. Okay. Hi. I am Susan Howell. I am a professor of psychology at Campbellsville University in Central Kentucky. And um, I have taught a gender studies course now for about 15 years. And... A lot of what I write in the book are things that I cover in class that students tell me they've not heard before. And I've done a lot of speaking at conferences, and I get the same from people there, that a lot of this just seems to go unnoticed. So that's why I wrote the book. And I'm so glad that you did. Um, you mentioned in the beginning of the book, too, um, that if God is calling a woman to lead, what's holding them back? That was like that question that kind of led you to 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 start thinking and writing about that so you mentioned that it was a student too that you were engaged with in a conversation can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that sure um we had spent the whole semester talking about how very often men and women get um channeled in different directions and that that leads us to having a variety of interests and hobbies and career goals and the way we look at life. And and then we get to the end of the semester and she said, so if women are called, why aren't they, why aren't they, you know, jumping in and answering that call? And, and I thought, wow, um, we've talked about that all semester. And I realized that she had not made the jump from understanding that all of those socialization factors, <clears throat> they influence us and everything from whether we want to play with Barbie dolls or baseballs, everything from whether we take a lot of math to whether we take home economics. But she sort of seemed to have a, a block where she wasn't thinking of it affecting how we think about God and ministry. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really interesting. So when I started going to conferences, I realized that people there were kind of having the same glitch it was almost like they thought that when God calls us, it happens in a vacuum without anything else playing a part. So that was really what spurred me on to think that, oh, my, this needs to be written. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> even for myself, I mean, I've been in ministry for a long time, over 30 years. And um, I, I couldn't believe that I didn't even think of this myself. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of us as women, we go through, you know, life not really seeing how these um, gendered socialization environments are all, all around us. And there, there was a part that you, um, actually Mimi, who wrote, wrote the foreword of your book. Hi, Mimi. Um, <laughs> she mentions how a lot of times we don't even do uh, what we think is what God is calling us to do because society doesn't see that as the right path for a woman and as a person that's already working with uh, in a field basically that's male dominated in church planting um i see this quite often where women 
get this like epiphany, like, oh my God, did really did God really call me to this? Because I've only seen men do it. Or I've only heard men say that other men can do it. Mm-hmm. So so this book brings it up onto the forefront of, of people's minds that a lot of the things that we think was a God thing was really a man thing and, and literally a man thing. <laughs> right. 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 So so that's why I think this book is so important that we get it into the hands of as many young ladies as possible, because I I don't want them to be like me that found out late, late, late that God can call me and and feel and the embrace that I could do this and that I don't need a man's permission. Um, So I think that's that's crucial. Now, um, you when, when you talk about gendered socialization and why women and, and, and men need to know about this. How can you break it down for my audience that may have never heard of the term before? Well, I think of it as being anything that channels us or has an impact on us that nudges us in the direction that, that, that people believe we should go. And uh, with it being like say in our churches, you know, would be the direction that the church thinks we should go or in our culture, what, what do our teachers and our parents and so on think, what's the direction they think we should go. And so it can take the form of so many things. And that's one thing that I always emphasize to my students is that it's more than just someone sitting down with you and saying, okay, Susan, um, when you get to be older, you could do this, this, or this. It's so much more subtle than that. It is everything from the toys we're handed or the toys that we are, that subtly might be taken out of our hand if we pick up a toy that the other gender is supposed to play with, you know, Um, or the kinds of TV shows that we're exposed to, the books that we're given as gifts, the type of a school where we go and whether or not our teacher says, hey, I think you really should try art. I think you have a talent there. Or if they say, oh, computers, that's really where it's at. You need to be spending your free time doing that. It happens so subtly and so from so many different directions. And it happens so frequently that it goes beyond our notice. It's, I I always say, tell my students, it's sort of like the fish not realizing what water is because it's so much a part of that fish's environment, they don't recognize it. And I think that's very often what happens to us when it comes to being socialized. That's true. I mean, you mentioned in your book about the language, the way we talk to one another, Mm -hmm. uh, the the, the media that we see, like, it's, it's true. It's it's everywhere mm-hmm. and i guess we're we've just kind of been numb to it and we don't pick it up until something like this comes along that kind of brings it back to that forefront uh you know which is which is super important because now i'm like okay how do i say this you know um, i'm a little bit more uh cautious about how i say something mm-hmm. even even to my son because it could be reversed right sure Right. So, so I think uh, that that was a big kind of uh, wake up call for me in a way. You know. Now you said earlier about <clears throat> that this is not something that that happens in a vacuum, right? This the the God God's call. You know, it comes. It, you you hear it for women most of the time. You know, you just feel that nudge like this is supposed to be uh, the way that I should go. But then you don't see any role models. You don't see anyone speaking the language that, you know, when, when they're, or even when you're seeing a job description for a pastor, it's always like, he shall be married to one wife, you know, like all these different right. things that doesn't say man, but in every other way, it says a man only should apply. Right. What do you think is something that um, for our listeners, how can they kind of decipher and kind of discern when, when they're experiencing those socializations around them? Well, I think becoming aware of it is really crucial. And so my hope is that anybody who reads this book is going to be kind of like you said just now, that it's making you second guess and be cautious, even in the way the language that you would use maybe with your son. 
I think that that is the big thing. What I have seen again and again and again with my students is that after they've been in the class, maybe about halfway through the semester, they'll say, oh, I can't believe I went home for the weekend and we were all sitting around the table. And I just realized that my dad expects my mom to get whatever he needs and that she doesn't even eat until she makes sure everybody else. And that was something that had gone on all their life, but they had never once noticed it. Or they'll say something like, I went to a wedding and it occurred to me, why is it that the father gives away the bride? What is what does that mean? And how did it originate? And and so all of a sudden, everything that's happening in their lives becomes something they want to investigate more fully. And so I think that's that is probably the best thing is just that the more aware we are um, to just stop and ask yourself occasionally, wait, why did I do it that way? And why is it that we get ready to take a family trip and the husband or the dad sits behind the wheel of the car automatically? Or why is it that mom is always the one who organizes the play dates? Or why is it that the older sister is the one who's asked to sit in the nursery at church, but the boys aren't? And so I think just becoming really aware of the things that have existed all along. And what my students tell me is that, that and they joke, they say it like they're joking, but I know, I know that, that it's true, is they'll say, am I ever going to look at the world the same way again? And I say, gosh, I hope not, because I want for them to go out into the world and look at it through different lenses. And, and one thing I pride myself on is when students to take my class and, you know, read these sort of things, the, like in the book that I've written and in articles that I give them to read, it happens it they notice things and they can't quite shake it off and i just love that that's like the most exciting part for me yeah it is and and um you know i i, I agree with you i i hope that as people read this they they're just they have that awareness and they understand what their interactions with others and how it impacts people even in in choice of vocation like like I mean, it really uh, is something to think about. For, you, you mentioned this in your book about the three stages, um, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood, that they, and in, in each of those um, stages, there's all these gendered socialization cues that they get. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think about, even for myself now, um, my husband is the primary caretaker for, at, at home for, one, for my special needs child. I'm the I'm the uh, um, the the one that works because now you know we we switched it up and throughout our 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 marriage I guess we didn't get the memo that there was supposed to be some things that he only did and that I only did right um, we just we just did what worked for us right sure. right and and we always switched it off depending on what was going on and what stage we were in in each other's lives you know I was I was going back to school getting my doctorate this and that. And he was like, okay, I got the kids, I got this, I got that, you know, and we switched it off when when he was busy doing a lot of things in ministry and I was home and I was homeschooling. So we we were able to do that, but it's because we kind of shut out whatever anybody else was thinking, you know, which I think is like a really great thing to do. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about what are some of the things that some people can, can probably see if we go in through each of those stages? Mm-hmm. So you mean like specific things that they can notice, you mean, yes. or, or like do differently or um, in their own life and, and how they're running things? Both, because I think like if there's someone that's watching that has a, a child, what are some of the things that they could look out for yeah. so that they're not um, <clears throat> perpetuating these cues for, the, for their kids? Right. Well, one thing that I have really tried hard to do myself when my children were little, and certainly when I'm around any children now, is being careful not to equate being a girl with being interested in, in 
in the things of the home. Like for instance, um, we tried really hard to get away from giving our children toys that were gendered. Um, we would buy dolls for our daughter, but we also bought them for our son. And we bought sports equipment for our son and for our daughter. And, and, and we tried to, to change that around. We also tried to watch how we spoke to them. I don't know how much I went into it with the book, but there is some research that shows that parents are more likely to talk about happy events with their sons and daughters, but they're more likely to talk about difficult, challenging, sad events with their daughter, but not so much their son. And so I remember reading that when our kids were little and realizing that I didn't want to do that. And so I started noticing whenever we were talking, for instance, about like, for instance, if we were out at a, an amusement park and we would have the talk with our children. Like if we get separated, we're going to meet back here or you're going to find someone who looks like they work here and let them know that you're lost. And I found myself wanting to have those conversations a little more with my daughter than my son. Mm -hmm. And that was exactly what the research showed is that we tend to be more light-hearted when we talk to our little boys and girls. And so I started just making a point to not do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure I still did it a lot more because we, I was raised in this culture and it has become ingrained in me too. But I did try, you know, not to. And I tried to not equate going to the doctor with it's always a man doctor or if there's someone going to be staying with you it doesn't always necessarily going to be a teenage girl you know and so i tried we tried my husband and i to just be really careful about the assumptions that were coming through our own language and through the toys that we bought and the books that we bought them and the television shows that we turned on and um we made a real effort toward that. And I have heard other people say that they've noticed that in us. So I think that we were at least partially successful. In that's that. great. No, that's so true. I mean, I think, again, you know, I don't know, maybe because I don't have any girls. Um, my oldest boy, like, I, he has curly hair like me. And, um, and I, you know, he lets me do his hair. Uh -huh. and, um, and I get a kick out of that. And I always say, you know, thanks for letting me do that. Um, but it's because it's already ingrained in me that most boys wouldn't um, mm -hmm. uh, do that. And, and because he was mostly homeschooled, most, you know, most of his life, he just graduated college. <clears throat> he, um, he looks at me like, what's the big deal? You know, right? Um, and because he didn't get those cues growing up because he wasn't around so many people that would tell him these things, you know? Um, so I, I think it's so important for people to pick up on those things that we ourselves do um, just because, you know, we, we think that's the norm and, and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. That's why, again, I think some of the things that you talk about in your book are really important for us to, to highlight. Now, you mentioned something else too. You, you talk about building a support system. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I mean, you, you go into a few things, you know, you know, your future spouse, your spouse, and, and you know, friends, and all these different things that um, could help you to uh, get the right message across. Even, even you know, connecting with like-minded people, which we should be doing that anyway, right? Right. Um, you know, it's always you know more fun when you're when you're aligned in so many ways. But how how do you feel a uh, a support system can be built for people? You know. Uh, let's say they, they, you know, they're, they're just hearing this message now and they're like, you know, that's so true. I want to be a little bit more aware of how I um, socialize my, my children or, or my youth. What mm -hmm. would you tell them as far as building a, a support system? I think it is really important. And I think, you know, like for ourselves, whenever I have a lot of students who will sometimes be learning some of this and then they'll say, well, but my boyfriend doesn't agree or my parents, they argue with me about this, or I have a group of friends and they don't want me to do. And something that I very often want to tell them, and I have to be really careful about it, I realize, is that if they're surrounded by people like their parents, boyfriends, girlfriends, um, 
friendship groups, church, and so on, who are pulling them away from the changes that God is bringing about in their life, then they really need to give serious thought to expanding their social network. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I gently suggest to them that maybe the friends that they are spending so much time with aren't helping them to grow, but are maybe holding them back. And, and it is a really delicate thing because to tell a college student or for that matter, anybody, any individual that they need to rethink their friends. I mean, that that's a serious thing. And I get that it's not an easy thing to do, but that, but I do try to gently suggest that if people in your life don't get you, if they don't support you being the best person you can be, then you might want to rethink what's their motive. And I always tell the story. My husband um, is a minister and he talks about learning in college about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. And he said that when he heard about this self-actualization as being that the goal, he said, why would any man not want his wife to self-actualize? He said, why would you not want the person who you love the most to self-actualize? And I thought, that's a great question. And we could ask that of anybody. Why would we want to hang around with friends who are wanting us not to be the best we could be? So I try to gently encourage that. And I think as parents, of course, we have a lot of say over that when our kids are really little. We decide where they're going to go to church, if they're going to go to church. We who to set up the play dates with and um, which cousins you want them to spend more time with than others. Uh, but as they get older, you know, you're right. They're going to be making a lot of those decisions. But sometimes I think we could still put in that plea for them to read. Who are you spending your time with? Are these people helping you? Or are they holding you back? And this guy that you're dating, does he really get you and what you want out of life or not? And so sometimes I think depending on the age of the child and the relationship you have with them, um, you can very subtly suggest to them and face it. Sometimes we have to do more than suggest. We have to just very bluntly say, look, she is not good for you. He is not good for you. Uh, but, you know, I mean, you've got kids, so, you know, you've got to be really delicate with that. But but I do encourage parents to to guide, especially when their kids are little, when you've got some control over that to guide where they spend their time and who their support system is. Yeah. No, um, you know, as a, as a Latina, um, I know many Latina moms, they, they go straight for the jugular and they'll just tell you, right? Like, listen, I don't like that person. That, that person ain't good for you. Um, you know, um, there's a Spanish saying that I, um, tell me who you walk with and I'm, and I'll tell you who you are, you know? Oh, right. That, yeah. So, so it, and I know for, for sure in our culture, Latina moms, they're not, they're not too subtle. <laughs> they're, they just tell you like what, what they want to tell you to get the message across. Well, that's like, really good. Yeah. No, really and, good. And, and, and for most, most Latino kids, they don't love it. They're like, Oh mom, please. You know, and they're like, man, like you said, you know, they, yeah. they, you know, they wish they were more delicate, but, but sometimes they'll even say it in front of the person. So, um, you know, you know, Latina moms, you know, they're strong, but you know, sometimes they, you know, they, they're not, they don't really care about other people's opinions. They're like, uh, I'm going to tell you because you're my kid. I don't care what the kid down the block does. You're my kid. And this is what I want you to do. Exactly. So, you know, that's so, so, you know, power to the, to the moms out there that, that will, will, will do that. Um, I think it's important. And again, that's why I think this conversation is important because so there's so many people, um, not only, you know, your book is titled very talents, but I feel that, um, you know, I remember reading a quote by Miles Monroe years ago about how the cemetery is the place of most potential in the world because so many people die with potential inside. Mm. And, and I feel like that is um, what, what is, what is, um, what people look forward to, I shouldn't say look forward to, but what they, what is coming to them if they allow people to bury their talents, you know, um, because only you um, are, are able to control what you say yes to, what you say no to, mm -hmm. what, what mm -hmm. opportunities you take. But, 
because, and I'm so grateful that we live in this era now where more and more women are realizing their own agency and saying, mm -hmm. wait a minute, like, why am I listening to all these people, self-appointed gatekeepers? You know, I, so I'm so grateful that we're in this place now, uh, as opposed to in some other times where, you know, you wore the scarlet letter if you did anything that was outside of the norm, you know? Right. But but I, I feel that, that now, because especially in the church, um, women, most most men and women get a lot of their messages from the church. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like like the church doesn't even realize the the, the key important role that they play mm -hmm. in these kind of, of, of discussions because most people learn how to be a citizen. They learn how to be a parent. They learn how to be a, you know a wife or, or a husband in church um, by by either what they hear or what they don't hear right. and what they see, right? So I'm wondering, like, what would be some advice that you might want to give a pastor even? Because you, you mentioned um, it, as part of your discussion guide, actually, you talk about the uh, the roles that men and women have in the church, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I think about, again, I've, I've been blessed and I, and I thank God because I grew up in a church that um, didn't really have those kind of things. Um, I didn't see a woman pastor until later on in life. But they never preached against it, so right. so I didn't realize that there was such a world until I got older and I started hearing other people talk about that they couldn't do certain things because they weren't allowed. I don't know, and I'm the type of person that's like allowed, <laughs> you know. I'm I'm a I'm a grown woman. What are you talking about? So, but but I understand that some some women are not as radical as I. And will like to, you know, stay in the lane that that they think was made for them, you know. So I'm wondering, like, like what pastors can do to help their congregants, you know, to see that that that, that God's call is for all, and that, um, you know, that that there's a way that they can invite women to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the one of the best things that pastors can do, or any leader is simply listen to what the women are saying because I think a lot of, at least a lot of women that I've talked to don't feel like they've been heard at church. They don't feel like they've been given a voice or not, not given a voice because we have a voice, but that their voice hasn't been taken seriously. And so I would say the biggest thing is just to listen. And, you know, even if you call together groups or like um, of people, uh, men and women, to talk openly about what their experience has been in church uh, without trying to defend whatever has been or without trying to negate what they're saying, without trying any of that, but just simply to listen to what their experience has been. I think a lot of churches would be surprised to find out that women very often don't feel like they have a voice unless they speak through their husbands or if they try in some way to um, manipulate or like drop a hint here or a hint there. And the fact of it is, is we shouldn't have to drop hints. Um, church leadership should be listening as much to what women have to say and as much of, as what our experience is as they do to what men have to say. So I think that's the big thing is just simply listening, um, listening to what women have to say. And I, I know several people have asked me like, what about using this book even as like a, a book study for a Sunday school class or a Sunday evening um, study of some sort where people read it and then like break into small groups and talk about some of those discussion questions. Um, I think that that would go a long way on opening the eyes of people. We talked a lot, uh, you and I, but other people too, about the importance of women seeing this. But I think it's as, as important for the men in our lives to see this too, because until men get on board, it's still going to be an uphill battle. So I think even for church groups, men and women, um, teenagers, young adults, even older folks, to be able to have a book discussion 
or a Sunday evening where they listen to the women of the church talk about what their experience has been. The more communication that we can open up, obviously the better that'll be for everyone. Yeah, I think that's a great, great suggestion. And like you said, I mean, it's, it's, it should be obvious. Listen, listen, you know, um, because women have so much to share and and, and a lot of times their voice is in center. Um, so pastors out there, listen, listen to what the women in your church are saying. Give them an opportunity. Um, definitely, again, um, get the book because this will be something that you can read so that you can learn because you, you should never stop learning as a pastor, but also um, so that you can um, have these groups going on in your church with uh, some of the ladies and men. Um, so that they can discuss this. Because again, I think most people don't know that they've been socialized to think this way. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's why it's so important to have that flag go off or that alert bell to go off so that they can understand that, wait, you know, this was something that was ingrained in me, but it wasn't necessarily something that God says that we should be doing. <laughs> so, And I think that's where we got it messed up in, in our society and in our denominations and things like that. Um, so one of the things you also mentioned in your book is that how you can't talk about everything in, in one book, and <laughs> which is so yeah. true, right? Because then it would be mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, a few volumes, especially talking about women, right? Because we, right. we, we, we have, we're, we're uh, uh, deep individuals. Um, and you mentioned about intersectionality, right? And how mm -hmm. um, gender and race and class, they intersect. Uh, mm -hmm. So you couldn't address all those issues in your book. So I'm wondering, um, what would you tell the woman that's watching today that, um, you know, to encourage her that, yes, maybe they have um, felt multiple maybe microaggressions in any mm -hmm. of those areas, um, and they feel that that their, their talent has been buried for years and it probably needs some excavation. What would you encourage that young woman or that older woman that thinks it's too late? How would you encourage them? The first thing I would suggest is, first of all, for them to trust their own feelings and experiences. And as long as I've taught gender studies, I was embarrassed to find out a few years ago, even, that there was so much that I wasn't even scratching the surface. Like you said, with intersectionality and some of my um, sociologist colleagues, you know, have sort of highlighted that. And I've had, and since I don't know a lot. I've had some, one of my colleagues who's come to my class and talked about that. And so I've sat and listened to her lecture on it so that I'm more informed. And so I would say, if you are a person who feels like you have experienced that, like you said, not just as a woman, but, um, you know, where you mix in race, ethnic, class, so many, so many variables, trust your experience. And if what you read and this book or any book is like, yeah, sort of, but you know, there's so much more there. Trust that and realize that people like myself who are just learning that this is so much deeper than we even thought, um, you know, don't let the fact that not every book describes that um, hinder you from trusting yourself and get out there and find as many like-minded people as you can and other books and articles that are written. And, and that's frankly where I am right now is um, realizing, like I said, a few semesters ago that I wasn't even doing service to some of the women in my class who are of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. I wasn't doing them a service by not even realizing it. So I started having people come to class who can speak on it. So now I'm learning and they're learning. And frankly, I think it might be good for them to know that I'm still learning too, that, that I, I, I don't know everything there is to know about this. So I'm not sure if that answered your question other than to trust your experience, um, realize that you're not, none of us are going to find everything we need in one book, but do push yourself to get out there, look for what's out there, meet people, find articles and don't stop until you find other people who are like-minded who can help you and don't stop speaking your truth enough so that people like me who have just now realized that there's more to it 
so that we'll now be aware of it and can bring that into the conversation. Yeah, so I think that answered your question. Sure. But. Absolutely, and, and I, I think that's that's the important thing to to trust your experience. Um, you know, your your reality is your lived experience, and it, and it matters. It's, it shouldn't be negated because somebody else said something else. Um, it's their experience, you know, and I think that's really important. And so I thank you for saying that. And I do want to, again, encourage women to uh, find those like-minded minds that you mentioned and that support, because I, I, I really, um, I understand that sometimes we stay in communities because that's all we know, mm -hmm. you know, because I've always like try to understand that because I've always been more like the rebel child, you know, that I'm not going to do anything that doesn't feel good with me. Um, but but for a lot of people, you know, they they do. They'll stay even though they're not happy. They'll stay even though they don't. Um, um, uh, uh, their 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 gifts are not seen. They're not even seen, but they'll stay. So mm -hmm. so I I just want to encourage as well women to to find those uh, like minded people, those uh, uh, empowerment environments that you also mentioned in your book, because you know. I, I don't want you to be those people that end up in the cemetery with potential inside. I, you know, if you still have that that desire to do something, you feel God is calling you to do something, that's because that is a nudge from the spirit, you know, and, and listen to that as well, right? And um and and know that, you know, this God wants it to come out somehow. So sometimes we need a little push and, and it's the, the push of a friend, the push of a pastor the nudge of, of, you know, someone that, that sees our gifting and, um, and gives us an opportunity. Um, Cause that's the other thing too, in order for, uh, uh, I, I mean, and I saw this somewhere too. I, don't, I never remember where I see things, but I remember the, what I saw. Uh -huh. And uh, that's the, that's because of my age now. See, I forget things, but it doesn't matter. It, but what matters is that I remember this, that it, it was a, a picture of a flower and it says, um, if, if the flower is not growing, it's not, because it's something's wrong with the flower, something wrong with the environment, right? And the soil, right? And so I, I, I want to just like tell whoever's watching this today to to remember if they feel like they're not flourishing, it's probably not you. It's probably the people around you. It's probably the places where where you continue to allow yourself to stay. Um, and and I just pray that you will you know find those those communities that will encourage you and. And speak into what what you already feel inside um, that God is, is calling you to do, because because you don't want any buried talents. And I think too, um, whenever we talk about the fact that, like you said, if the soil, if the environment isn't conducive, you know, to our growing, one thing that I found is that there are a lot of women who will be the very first person to encourage somebody else to nurture themselves and to do whatever they're feeling called to do. And yet they don't want to give themselves that same, um, that same freedom. And so I would add to that too, that try to see that any growth that you're being led to anything that is pulling you toward growth and wholeness and in reaching your potential, that isn't selfish. That is your moving in the direction that maybe you were born to move into. And so it's not in any way a selfish thing. It's simply saying yes to whatever God is wanting you to do. And that is probably the least selfish thing you can do is just simply going with that. And so I, I fully agree. I think like you said about the, it's the environment that very often holds us back. Yeah. Um, and, and it's interesting too, because you mentioned spouse also, right? You mentioned spouse in your, uh -huh. and, and um, wow, what an important decision you make with the person that you marry. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, because, you know, uh, 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 you mentioned in the beginning of your book too, how your husband was very supportive of you writing when you felt like this need to get this message out there, even though you didn't see yourself as a person that would do something like that. And so I feel like spouses are so crucial to to our further development as well. I mean, my husband too is my biggest cheerleader, and he, you know, he'll do whatever. He always says, "I'll carry your bags," you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever he needs, whatever needs to be done to yeah. to support, you know, what I believe God is calling me to do. So I, I want to just also um, uh, encourage uh, young women out there 
that are dating um that you know don't don't get married so quick you know um mm -hmm. and don't just choose a spouse because you don't want to be single because um that could really lock you down um in so many ways so if they if they're not supportive of you and in, in your dreams when you're dating uh don't think you're going to change them when you marry right that's exactly right yeah it won't change it won't get better that's it sure. won't get better you know yeah. but you know it won't get better it just yeah. just just take our word for it it's not going to get better so <laughs> if if you're dating and he's already like oh okay, i don't want you to do this or why are you doing that or i'm not involved in this so you can't do that yeah shut it down <laughs> that's exactly right and i have been surprised at how many students have are in relationships that are not good for them. They're not conducive of growth. And students, um, I mean, not just students, but I mean, the people that I know, most of them are students. They don't, um, they find it really hard to get out of those relationships. And I have become increasingly aware that that's a real issue. And so, yeah, I, I echo your sentiments there. If, if, it's, if it's not working as a dating, relationship it will not get better later with them. yeah and you know it's interesting because in, in 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 the community that i grew up in you know and there was always the past to track so there was like no other vocation was as good as the past to track so everybody was like okay well i guess i'm not anything because i don't i, I don't feel called to the pastorate yeah. or or you felt like i have to be a pastor even though i don't have a call for that right oh right you know but there was also this underlying uh, message that it, that you should marry a pastor right or you you should marry the guy that that is visible that has public ministry that you know so that way you know you're 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 somebody or something mm -hmm. you know? right and so sometimes people stay in relationships um because of that even though they already know that 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 person is not going to be supportive of their dreams their that mm -hmm. their only role is to be supportive of the man's dream right um right that's most of the stuff that we've seen uh you a lot of people stay because they feel like well he's the one that everybody thinks i should be with he's mm -hmm. the one that everybody thinks is going to be a pastor or a minister or so 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 you know again that's a, that's like the wrong reason to be with someone mm -hmm. and, and when you see the flags you know don't ignore them because you right. you, you you will regret them after you're married. And it's so, so much harder to um, to backtrack on a marriage as it is to just backtrack on, on a dating situation. Sure. You know, so, That's so exactly right. yeah, right? I mean, you know, you're happily married. Yes. I'm happily married. Yes. Take it from us, people. <laughs> Do the right thing. Marry, marry yeah. right, marry right. That's right, exactly. Yes. It's important. So one, uh, well, actually maybe two, two last questions. Um, who is this book most written for and and who should read it if they didn't fit the description that you're going to give now? <laughs> okay i think that uh, it's written mostly for young women who are trying to come to terms with how the, which direction their life is going what is their calling what do they need to be doing in this world and i as you probably do know um define calling here is anything that God is asking you to do. Certainly not even, uh, it wouldn't have to be in a formal ministry like a church. It could be your calling to be, you know, a doctor or a, any, anything at all, any profession, any, anything. Okay. So, um, for women who need to be free to explore that call, and to try their best to get away from these socialization, um, the socialization that they've been handled. Uh, but also, I think for young adults, period, like men, for instance, who are going into the ministry and they want to be able to minister well to women, and they want to be able to encourage the people that are entrusted to their care. Um, with following their call regardless. I think it's also for anybody who has an influence with children, sons, daughters, nieces, nephews, grandchildren. If you are a Sunday school teacher, a scout leader, a youth sports, whatever, if you have some impact on a child, 
for you to realize the part of socialization that you're playing without even realizing it and being able to jump in in a healthy way to be one more voice that's leading them in the right direction. And I think that's good. So that, I guess it really, it's, it's for a lot of people then. <laughs> that's right. And I like the fact that you mentioned also, you know, earlier that it's also for men. So, right. you know, I want to make sure that men actually, because men so many times are the main gatekeepers in so many areas, sure. um, they probably are the first people that should be this. And, um, and of course, you know, women that are, that feel like they, they have so much more to give, you know? So thank you so much, Dr. Howell, for being with us today. I do want to encourage our viewers to consider buying the book. Um, today, uh, uh, up until next week, you'll be able to get this book at 30% off if you go to ivypress.com and just use Justice. Justice at ivypress.com and they'll even throw in free shipping. So, no excuses. Get the book. <laughs> get the book for your friends. Get the book for your pastor friends. And if you are a pastor, put this in your library. We definitely want more educated pastors on this issue of gendered socialization thank you again so much and one parting word that you would have for our viewers today I, I would really love to hear from anyone who has read the book i love nothing better than discussing this with people and so if you uh check out susanharrishowell.com you'll find my website and all of my socials and you can contact me through any of those and i would just absolutely love to hear from you and um talk with you about any of this wonderful and we will make sure that we put her contact information in the posting as right. well so you know how to reach her thank you so much for being thank with you us so much i've i've enjoyed it a lot thanks wonderful wonderful and thank you for watching and join us next month when we'll have another author with us thank you so much god bless Justice.